what is seen on television or read in books to actually behaviours, particularly if that person is in a depressed state um, or is in fact possibly contemplating suicide. Just to hark ho back to rock. He was a withdrawn and arrogant man with a pessimistic view of the world. Although he had a great deal of passion for adventure, he also felt frustrated and depressed. He was extremely intelligent, but his personality was very complex. This contradictory nature often brought him face to face with danger and destined him for an unimaginably difficult and strange life of reckless adventure. His name was Joseph Rock. The world of 1922 was very complicated. And this led to chaos in China with strikes, demonstrations, murders, and even the threat of war everywhere. Joseph Rock was a fearless American who plunged headlong into the chaos of a country he didn't understand without the slightest hesitation. Records show that he lived in Lijiang for 27 years from 1922 until he left China in 1949. During those 27 years, his life was completely turned around and he created a legend. Later, he often dreamed of Lijiang's snow-covered mountains and his Chinese friends. But fate was not on his side. After he left China, he was never able to return to his beloved adopted home. Richard Warburton, who plays Joseph Rock, worked in the hotel industry for several decades before coming to China in 1998. He came to Lijiang in 2005 as the director of human resources in Yunnan for a hotel chain. What's going on with Lijiang Airport and the new routes and um, to enlighten you with what's going on in um Time, time passes very quickly here. One is, <laughs> one uh, has sort of usually so much to do, um, either in work or otherwise, and the time time just goes by. Um, it's also always reminded me of um, sort of childhood days in Scotland with the mountains and the rain. <laughs> Lijiang's exotic landscape and its unique cultural charm have attracted people from around the world. But Rock also had other reasons for coming here. People have long admired Rock for his outstanding accomplishments, but few understand the man himself. In order to properly play the part of Rock, Warburton studied Rock's writings. He hoped his performance could help people understand Rock's time in Lijiang and his reasons for staying so long. Rock was born January the 13th, 1884 into an aristocratic family in Vienna, Austria. His mother died when he was only six. Under pressure from his tyrannical father, he attended divinity school to become a minister. But chafing under the heavy pressure, Rock fled Vienna without graduating to travel around Europe alone. 
first dramatic turn in his life occurred in 1905 when he boarded a steamship to the United States, earning his passage by washing dishes. He obtained U.S. citizenship when he reached New York. Two years later, his life took another turn in Hawaii, where he went to recover from tuberculosis. The climate in Hawaii seems to have done the trick because he recovered very quickly. Rock used his amazing gift for language to learn no less than nine languages. He even created a fake PhD diploma from a Vienna university, of which he was very proud, to get a job as professor of Latin. He devoted most of his spare time to exploring the flora of Hawaii and studying botany. It didn't take him long to parlay his newly acquired knowledge into a position as professor of botany at the University of Hawaii. But the biggest turning point in his life occurred in 1920. That year, the US Department of Agriculture sent him to India and Burma in search of chalmugra trees, the seeds of which could be used to treat leprosy. Two years later, however, Rock heard that the seeds of a tree growing in the mountains of southwest China were even more efficacious. He subsequently left for China and arrived in Lijiang on May the 11th. 1922. For convenience in collecting plant specimens, Rock set up camp in Xuesong village, a Naoshi village at the foot of Yulong Mountain, well outside Lijian. There, he rented a courtyard house in his temporary home. He was then 38 years old and confident that he would accomplish something great in the second half of his life, something that would astonish the world. Records indicate that he put on airs when out in public and demanded everyone who worked for him call him Dr. Rock. Lijiang has a plateau monsoon climate. It is home to dense forests teeming with life. It has an amazing variety of flora and fauna. In just one year, Rock collected 60,000 plant specimens, 1,600 bird specimens, and 60 mammal specimens, a significant achievement. His collection far exceeded what the U.S. Department of Agriculture had asked for. NASA's work neared completion in July 1923. Rock began packing his specimens to return to the United States in triumph. Coincidentally, the Nashi people in the village were celebrating their annual torch festival. During this festival, everyone gathers around a bonfire at the edge of the village, hoping that the fire is long-lasting and fierce, an omen of good fortune for the villagers in the coming year. The torch festival is also an important courtship ritual. And in accordance with ancient tradition, young men and women choose their mates at the bonfire. Rock found the sultry singing of the young men and women to be very attractive and pleasing. But for the villagers and most of the dancers, the cheerful music masked a barely perceptible sense of unease. When the music stopped and everyone dispersed, Four young couples had gone missing, and a sense of dread enveloped the village. 
Anxious parents and concerned relatives spread out in all directions calling to the missing couples. Everyone knew what it meant if they weren't found right away. Unfortunately, the search had to be continued the next day. When they were finally found a day later, they had all hanged themselves. Rock was deeply disturbed by this unimaginable scene. Strangely, when Warburton as Rock walked onto the set for this scene in the docudrama and saw the eight figures swaying in the wind, he was completely at a loss. Although separated by 88 years, they both had the same shocked reaction. Um, my background, as I said, is not acting. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, th as I said, that was a long time ago. And it's been more, uh, my, my career's been in human resources. I've brought up three daughters. Warburton has three beautiful daughters, Claire, Andy, and Helen. He worried that this scene in the donkey drama would have a negative impact on young people his daughter's age. So he searched the records to find how Rock responded to the situation. The young people of Nashi had always been free to choose their girlfriends and boyfriends. Committing suicide for love first became prevalent in the late Ming and early Qing dynasties when the practice of arranged marriages was introduced from the Han culture. But this was in sharp conflict with the Nashi practice of free marriage, and many young Nashis would rather die than accept an arranged marriage. The Nashi Dungba religion even had a ceremony for committing suicide for love. According to the Dungba scriptures, when lovers committed suicide together, their souls went to a paradise without mosquitoes, flies, or wild animals, a place where everyone had plenty of food and clothing. This paradise was called the Third Kingdom of the Jade Dragon. When he returned to his tent, the totally confused rock tried to figure out what kind of place the Third Kingdom of the Jade Dragon was. The explanations of his assistant perplexed him even more. According to the Dungba religion, it was not outside of this world, but actually existed in this world. Rock watched in amazement as his assistant pointed it out on a map. Its name was Daocheng Arden. Daocheng Arden is situated in the Ganza Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture in Sichuan Province. Its name in Tibetan means holy place. But could this really be the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon mentioned in Nashi scripture? Brock's uncertainty only made him more curious. Nashi religious works are not written in familiar Chinese characters, but exotic hieroglyphs. Rock began traveling around the world at the age of 20, but he had never before seen anything so strange. This remote mountain range was the home of an incomprehensible culture whose customs, beliefs, and writing were utterly unique.
powerful curiosity and incomprehension stimulated Rock to write to the Department of Agriculture about the amazing profusion of flora there. He proposed staying another year to study the local plant's life in the hope that they would continue to support him. But in actual fact, this was just an excuse. In a stroke of genius, he asked the elders of the Dongba religion to re-enact the love-suicide ceremony in his courtyard so that he could have the chance to film it. His film, the only known record of this ceremony, would change the course of Rock's life. After he sent the undeveloped film and a letter to the United States, he recruited people from Shuasong village to help him carry out an expedition. One of the members of this expedition team was Li Shuqian, who was then just an ordinary team member. While preparing for the expedition, Rob discovered that he had to pass through a semi-independent theocratic kingdom to reach Daochang Argen. This kingdom, called Wuli, was ruled by a Tibetan Buddhist king and was closed to the outside world. Anyone trespassing without his permission, especially a foreigner such as himself, would not return alive. As part of his careful plans to realize his goals, Rock made friends with Ah Yuan Chan, the chief of the nearby Morsuo tribe. The Morsuo are a branch of the Nashi that live in Yongming, next to beautiful Lake Luhu. Rock was smart enough for once to act more humble and show as much enthusiasm as possible. As a result, the gregarious Ah Yuan Chan took to Rock very quickly, and they soon became friends. In the Morsaw language, Lugu means lake in a ravine. Lake Lugu is located on the border between Sichuan province and Yunnan province. The people here believe in Tibetan Buddhism. As it happened, Ah Yuan Jan had spent several years studying Buddhist scripture in Tibet, making him the key for rock to get to Mu Li. Everything went Rock's way. Ah Yuan Chan quickly wrote a letter of introduction to the King of Mu Li for him. Beautiful Lake Lugu is surrounded by mountains. The Morsuo the only remaining matriarchal society in China. The Morsaw have a tradition of walking marriages in which there is no husband and wife and the man and woman live separately. Rock lived on this small island in the lake. Ah Yunchen built a Lama chapel on a hill of the island and a cottage below it. In his letter replying to Rock's request, 
the Wuli king politely refused on the grounds that his country was plagued with armed bandits and he could not guarantee rock safety. This was, of course, a great disappointment for Rock. Even the great beauty of Lake Lugu could not lift Rock's spirits. Ha Yun Chen tried in vain to console him and convince him to abandon his adventure. However, Rock continued to discuss his plans for adventure countless times with A Yun Chen and even argued with him over them. One day, when he was gazing out the window at Lion Mountain to the east, a letter from the Department of Agriculture arrived and it lifted Rock's spirits. Not only did the department agree to support Rock, but it also forwarded a letter from the magazine National Geographic. Rock realized that a secret religion and a strange culture lay hidden in China's southwest, and that this was a golden opportunity for him to finally make a name for himself. When the National Geographic saw his film of the Love Suicide Ceremony, the magazine's editors believed that Rock had found some precious material. The magazine not only named Rock head of a National Geographic expedition in Yunnan, but also gave him generous financial support and photographic equipment. The news was like an elixir that immediately lifted Rock's spirits, and it greatly excited him. Rock quickly put the Muli King's refusal and Ah Yuan Chan's advice out of his mind and thought of nothing else but going to the Third Kingdom of the Jade Dragon. He was sure that it contained even greater secrets waiting to be discovered. Without telling Ah Yunchen, he ordered his expedition team to prepare to leave Yongning. But when they were about to cross the first wooden bridge, two fully armed soldiers blocked their road. Rock immediately realized that this was Ah Yunchen's doing, but it was determined now that he'd come this far, he wasn't going to turn back. His violent temper exploded. He began by swearing at his expedition team and yelling at his Nashi bodyguards. His hope was that this would result in them clearing the way for him. Nashi men have always fought other tribes and fierce beasts, but Li Shichen considered them also as brothers. He could never harm a brother on Rock's behalf. What happens next was completely contrary to Rock's expectations. Tell you, your toe, tell you. I will dare you. Rock's sense of superiority as a white man and his authority as expedition leader were met with stiff resistance. 
Roth never expected that his Nashi team members would be so insulted and then raged by his overbearing manner and verbal abuse. First, the Muli king had refused his request. Then Ah Yunshan had opposed his plans. And now his Nashi helpers were upset with him. Rock's bad temper had almost completely ruined his plans. He went back to Shuasong village alone with the empty title of leader of a national geographic expedition. He was not in a good mood. But he still held out hope. He believed that if his expedition was successful, he would have a bright future. Staring at the rain, he began to wonder what kind of people the Nashi really were. indicate that the Nashi are descendants of the ancient Qiang ethnic group that migrated here from northeast China. Their written language is even older than the Chinese oracle bone script. Because Li Jiang is surrounded on all sides by mountains, the traditional Nashi lifestyle remained unchanged for millennia. The Nashis that Rock knew were as simple, good-hearted, and as honest as their forebears had been. When he went to Rock's cottage to settle scores and leave, Li Shuqian was still very angry, but he found that Rock was not his usual self. Not only did Rock make a humble apology, he also had a great surprise for Li Shuqian. In 1923, China was in the midst of the warlord era. Although Li Jiang was relatively remote, it wasn't spared. Every year, many young men were conscripted for military service. But Rock promised that he would use his position as head of an American expedition to keep all the young men of Shuasong village, including Li Shuqian, out of the army. He shrewdly decided to make them members of his expedition team, effectively easing Li Shuqian's anger. Rock realized that Li Shuqian wouldn't fall for any tricks. He had to use sincerity and wisdom to win him over. The two men quickly made peace and agreed to start over, and they remained close friends for the next 20-some years. Things can fall into place quickly when a person makes a correct choice. Ah Yunshan brought heartening news. The old king, Muli, had just died, and he was succeeded by his friendlier younger brother. He might be more receptive to Rock's request and allow him to go there after all.
In January 1924, Ah Yuan Chen saw Rock's expedition team cross the wooden bridge with his blessing. Rock had begun his eagerly awaited adventure. But his destination was by no means a paradise filled with singing birds and fragrant flowers. This was a place that was cut off from modern civilization. A thrilling story about a tribal leader and his people was about to unfold against a magnificent natural backdrop. This was in spring 19. Rock also included some personal observations in his journal. He noted that the women wore old-fashioned ruffled skirts that nearly reached the ground. They also wore short vests and wide-brimmed hats that made it hard to see their faces. Most of the children looked malnourished with distended bellies and matchstick legs. These passages reveal the curiosity and sympathy of a typical white Westerner for ordinary members of a primitive culture. of National Geographic, however, was very unhappy with these passages, calling them rambling nonsense. But all the same, the magazine continued giving Rock a generous stipend because of the absolute uniqueness of his photos and film. After crossing several mountains, the team came to a ferry crossing on the Yangtze River. Because it was winter, it was safe to cross the river. However, there was only one small boat, so it took 10 trips to ferry all the mules and equipment across the river. Rock was not an outstanding writer, but Wu Ruilong has been able to get a vivid picture from Rock's plain writing, coupled with his photos and films of the mountains and rivers, flora and fauna, and the people of the region that had made a deep impression on him. It took 11 days for Rock and his team to reach the Kingdom of Muli, and they did so at the end of January 1924. Looking at the mysterious kingdom ahead through the clouds, Rock had no way of knowing whether or not he would succeed. He wondered what kind of person ruled this isolated kingdom and if he would grant the request of this white man from the West. He also wondered if he would help Rock realize his extravagant dream. When Qing Emperor Yong Zheng ascended the throne, a minister reportedly praised the men of Muli for their courage in battle. So the emperor granted them the authority to rule their lands in perpetuity. Rock excitedly recorded his first impressions of the Muli kingdom. 
He wrote that the king ruled a land covering 9,000 square miles, slightly larger than the state of Massachusetts, with a population of only 22,000 honest and humble people. The capital was a monastery with 340 buildings and 700 monks. The kingdom contained three large and 15 small monasteries. face and this made Rock uneasy. He desperately searched for a way to get him to smile. was pondering this problem, a young monk brought out a pile of old yellow photos. Rock looked at the king, wondering what kind of order he would give. The king beckoned Rock to come forward and explain the photos to him. Rock was astonished to discover that they were all photos of places he had visited in his youth. There were photos of Windsor Castle, the US White House, the Norwegian fjords, and restaurants and the dishes they served. Rock guessed that they must have been left here by a traveling merchant. But when the king asked whether he could ride from Mooley to Washington DC on horseback, Rock didn't know whether to laugh or cry. While Rock was enthusiastically explaining a photo of a German beer hall, the king asked whether Germany was near Washington. It made Rock sad to think of how isolated this kingdom was from the rest of the world. The king really needed to know more about the art. Suddenly, Rock noticed that a young monk standing to the side was incessantly scratching his head. And suddenly he realized that his whole body also itched. Rock quick.
quickly brought out a new gift. With everyone staring at him, Rock performed a spectacular performance. No one in this isolated kingdom had ever seen soap before, let alone used it. In the end, just three bars of soap were all it took to make the dignified king break out in a big smile. For a white westerner in this situation, the ability to relate is most important. Rock had arrived with poor social skills, but his adventures of the last few years have profoundly changed him, greatly improving his people's skills. After the soap demonstration, the Mooli King put on a lavish welcoming ceremony for Rock and his team. The next day, the King personally showed Rock around his kingdom. Westerner took numerous photos of buildings, temples, llamas, farmers, and women. Nothing escaped his attention. Everything went very smoothly. Rock's only regret was that he couldn't get the Mooli King to pose in the presence of his servants. Over a week of hard travel and several days of great excitement at the Mooli court left Rock exhausted. In the afternoon, a young llama brought a leather case to Rock's room and very respectfully woke Rock from his noon nap. With considerable curiosity, Rock opened the case to discover a French camera. However, it hadn't been used for many years and it was not in good working order. After profusely apologizing for waking him, the young llama nervously told Rock that the king had given him one hour to learn how to use it. Rock was very sympathetic and touched by the young monk's pious manner. But it was, of course, impossible to learn how to use a camera like this in just an hour. All the same, Rock patiently taught the young llama the rudiments of photography. The camera request made Rock realize that he was about to be expelled and had very little time left.
Since witnessing the shocking love suicide ceremony two years earlier, he'd been constantly looking for a way to reach the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon. Through sheer will, he had overcome countless obstacles to reach the gates of this heaven. And now, he was being forced to leave. He was under great pressure. Although he expressed great anger in his journal, he never gave up and used all his wits to reach his objective. He successfully hid his sense of superiority as a white westerner. He unpacked his French wine, American whiskey and crystal wine glasses and turned on all his charm to break down barriers. But again, the Muli king refused. However, Rock saw this as only a temporary setback. All he could do was wait until he was summoned by the king. But this would probably be his last chance for success. Rock had led his expedition team to the secret kingdom of Muli. The Muli king's warm-hearted reception had finally made it possible for Rock to approach the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon. But because of the natural dangers and fierce bandits on the road ahead, it was by no means certain he would ultimately succeed.